I am presenting Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number 13, the end of the summer quarter, August 29th, 2021. The lesson is entitled, Paul Faces His Accusers. Lesson text comes from Acts chapter 22, verses 17 through 29. Related scriptures are Acts 8, 1 through 3, 9, 1 through 30, Matthew 10, 14 through 20, and Ephesians 3, 7 through 19. The place is Jerusalem. The time is 56 AD. Other than Jesus Christ, no one in the New Testament was as much the object of persecution as the Apostle Paul. With his conversion to Christ, he almost instantly went from acting as the church's fiercest persecutor, Acts 7, 58 through 8, 3, to suffering as its most persecuted defender. He was a lightning rod for anger and hostility, and almost everywhere he went, there was someone who wanted to kill him. Yet through it all, he persevered and preached. This week's lesson will serve to encourage anyone who faces hatred and hostility for being a Christian and proclaiming the gospel. Be assured that the hardships you are dealing with are not new to Christians. History gives account after account of people being abused and mistreated for living according to the gospel and being faithful to Christ. Remember that the same spirit who indwelled and empowered Paul to persevere is the same spirit who indwells and empowers you. Today's aim, facts, to warn that hostile attitudes will exist towards Christians until Christ returns. Principle, to assure that Jesus promises to direct us if we are willing to follow him. Application, to not allow fear to control us, but to be willing to serve Christ at all costs. Illustrating the lesson. Like Paul, we should always faithfully follow Jesus, persevering through the hatred and hostility of the world. Practical points. One, whatever, wherever you are working for God, stay tuned to his voice and obedience to his direction. Acts 22, 17 through 18. Two, those who are most familiar with us can sometimes be our biggest opponents, verses 19 through 20. Three, Christians are to carry the gospel to all people everywhere without discrimination, verses 21 through 22. Four, God providentially puts unexpected people in key positions to aid believers and advance his work, verses 23 through 26. Five, the freedoms and rights we enjoy are gifts to be used in serving the Lord, verses 27 through 28. Six, the Christian life is a life of bold faith, especially in critical moments, verse 29. Golden text. And he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles, Acts 22, 21. Today we have two lesson outlines. The first is Paul's appeal to his countrymen, coming from Acts 22, 17 through 21. The second is Paul's appeal to the authorities, Acts 22, 22 through 29. Introduction. In a recent online listing of common phobias, fear of public speaking ranked third after heights and flying. Although some individuals obviously thrive on speaking before large gatherings, for many it is a dreadful prospect, even if the fear does not quite reach the level of a phobia. Christians seem to be affected by this fear as much as anyone, perhaps more so because the stakes in speaking for Christ are higher. A Christian speaker might wor might worry not only about how he or she comes across, but also about whether the audience is effectively reached and benefited for eternity. But even the most reluctant of speakers rarely worries that something he or she says in a speech might set off a riot. But if you want to know what it feels like to do that, just ask the Apostle Paul. In our lesson this week, we see that he managed to do exactly that with just a single word. It had to have been disconcerting. Paul's appeal to his countrymen, Acts twenty two seventeen, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, when even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, verse 18. 
and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Verse 19. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. Verse 20. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Verse 21. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul had recently returned to Jerusalem, Acts 21, 15. He had been warned by a prophet and tearfully urged by his companions not to go. But his mind was made up, verses 10 through 13. Paul had already known that imprisonment had imprisonment and suffering awaited him there, but he felt compelled by the Spirit to go there and complete the work he had been given by the Lord Jesus. 2022 through 24. Paul had been greeted warmly by the believers in Jerusalem, but also cautioned that suspicion and hostility against him were running high in the city, Acts 21, 17 through 21. To ally this, he agreed to join four men taking a purification vow while paying their expenses, verses 23 through 24. Things went smoothly for several days until he was spotted in the temple and falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the inner court where they were forbidden, verses 27 through 28. The angry mob would have killed Paul right then and there, but Roman troops intervened, putting him in chains and protective custody, verses 30 through 33. As the soldiers attempted to hustle him out of danger, Paul asked the chief captain, verse 37, Heliarchos, typically a commander of a thousand soldiers, here designating the leader of the Roman garrison in Jerusalem for permission to speak to the crowd, verse 39. He agreed and set Paul at the top of the steps leading to the Roman fortress, out of the reach of the angry throng. A deep silence ensued as he addressed the people, verse 40. Paul began his defense by reminding the crowd of his credentials and as a zealous student of Gamil and, and a persecutor of Christians, 22, 3 through 4. He then outlined his encounter with Christ on the way to Damascus. The main points, the light from heaven, Jesus' question and command, Paul's blindness and baptism are familiar to us from the account in chapter 9. But some added details are given toward the end. An order from the Lord, Acts 22, 7 through 18. The first new detail reveals that during Paul's first visit to Jerusalem as a Christian, 9, 26 through 28, he had gone to the temple to pray and had fallen into a trance, 22, 17. Jesus appeared to him again and told him to leave Jerusalem right away for the people there were not going to accept his testimony about him, verse 18. The warning from the Lord himself was apparently in addition to the intervention of fellow believers who helped Paul, then still named Saul, get out of Jerusalem after hearing of a plot to kill him, 9, 29 through 30. It seems likely that Paul received the word from the Lord first. He, we wonder if he would have resisted the believer's efforts to send him to safety if he had not been given the divine admonition. It would not have been the first time Paul proved resistant to advice. A protest by Paul. Acts 22, 19 through 20. As it was, Paul still tried to argue against the directive. He seems to have thought the Lord was overlooking a few key points and proceeded to fill him in on them. Paul reminded Christ that the people in Jerusalem knew his reputation. They knew he had been zealous to imprison believers in Jesus and to beat them violently in synagogues wherever he found them. Surely that degree of dedication had earned him the right to a fair hearing. And if that was not enough, Paul added the clincher. He had stood in solidarity with the men who had put Stephen to death, 758-81. This was an episode that Paul might have been uncomfortable reminding the Lord about, but he knew he had already been forgiven for it. 
and it bolstered his argument. These people know me. I'm one of them. They'll listen. It was the same argument Paul was now making to the Jerusalem mob that wanted him, wanted his head. He was reminding them that none of them had surpassed him in zeal for the law and hostility against the law's enemies, 22, 3 through 5. The change of heart he had undergone was a genuine one that they should have taken seriously because of the depth of his previous passion. It was a strong argument and should have been convincing. But as the Lord had known years before, persuasive arguments carry little force against a volatile, emotion-driven rabble. A Divine Plan, Acts 22:21. At the time of the original exchange, the Lord did not bother to argue the point, but simply reiterated his command, depart. Even if what Paul had claimed about his credibility with the people were true, Christ had something different in mind for him. The Lord already had plenty of witnesses in Jerusalem. He was going to send Paul into distant regions. He was to minister to the Gentiles. This was not exactly a new concept. Jesus had told his original disciples to make disciples all over the nations. Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15, Luke 24, 47, Acts 1, 8. The church had proved slow in obeying this directive, although some forays had been made prior to Paul's missionary work. Acts 28, 26 through 38, 10, 1 through 11, 18. Paul seems to have been commissioned specifically to jumpstart and propel this vital component of the Lord's work. Paul recounted this development dispassionately, regarding it simply as one of the essential facts of his ministry. His outreach to the Gentile world had never been a secret, so he apparently saw little reason why referencing it now would be an issue. Yet it turned out to be the spark that set off the power keg. Paul's appeal to the authorities, verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live, verse 23. And as they, care, as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, verse 24, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. Verse 25. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, It is lawful for you, it is it lawful for you to scrounge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned. Verse 26. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Verse 27. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. Verse 28. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Verse 29. Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him, and the chief captain also was afraid, after he knew that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. An explosion of rage. Acts 22, 22-24. The crowd had tempered its anger and had been listening quietly up to this point. But when Paul spoke the word Gentiles, the fury they had demonstrated earlier erupted into a violent surge, more intense and dangerous than before. With one voice they shouted, away with such, with such a reprobate from the earth, verse 22. The King James Version inserts the word fellow for the bracketed word, but the Greek has no noun at all, as if the crowd could not think of a term strong enough to convey their horror. They considered Paul unfit to live. The mob roared, threw off their outer cloaks, and tossed handfuls of dirt into the air. The situation was getting ugly, and the Roman commander was getting anxious. He therefore had Paul brought inside the security of the fortress, verse 24. But he was not concerned with his 
prisoner's safety as much as with finding out why he had incited such an uproar. So, he ordered that Paul be examined by scourging. Whether he, this intended scourging would keep him as extreme as the one Jesus endured is not certain, but it nevertheless pretended an intense and painful lashing. Paul had escaped the violence of the crowd only to face the violence of Roman law and order. A question of rights, Acts 22, 25 through 26. While he was being tied down in preparation for the whipping, Paul directed a question to the attending satyrian. Was it lawful for them to scourge a Roman citizen, especially one who had not yet been tried and found guilty of a crime? Paul, of course, knew the answer, as did the centurion. The question was, in reality, a challenge, and it quickly set the proceedings in a new and, un and unexpected direction. The centurion immediately responded this, reported this new development to the commander, urging him to reconsider what he was about to have done. To go ahead with the intended punishment would put them in a most precarious situation, for they were about to scourge a Roman citizen. They would That would mean they were the ones now in trouble. Examination of the claim, Acts 22, 27 through 28. The commander immediately returned to where Paul was being held. The apostle's question had been enough to divert the centurion from the planned course of action, but the commander wanted a direct answer. Was Paul really a Roman citizen? And Paul gave it to him, yes. The commander's next comment may strike us as somewhat odd. He told Paul that he too was a Roman citizen, but that it had cost him a great sum of money to obtain it, verse 28. His use of the term freedom is interesting. The Greek word is polea, which is related to our terms politics and policy. It could refer both to a state of commonwealth and to citizenship that citizen, citizenship in that body. When applied to an individual, it emphasized his rights as a citizen. Was there doubt in the commander's voice as he made his comment? It no doubt surprised him to hear Paul make such a bold claim. Roman citizenship was a was a was a was a converted status that conferred a wide range of privileges and protections not enjoyed by most subjects of the empire. Among these were the right to trial and the right to appeal verdicts. Citizens guilty of high crimes and sentenced to death were shielded from the worst forms of execution, often being allowed to choose the method themselves. And they were kept ex exempt from scourging and other forms of to torture. It was rare for Jews to be Roman citizens. The commander's comment may well have betrayed a hint of suspicion, perhaps implying doubt that someone like Paul would have sufficient means to purchase citizenship. Paul simply answered that he was born a citizen. This must have astounded the commander, but he did not dispute it or raise further objections, even though Paul did not explain how he was born into such a privilege. It may well rise questions in our minds, however, how could Paul have been born into such a status? As noted above, it was rare for a Jew to hold Roman citizenship, but it was not unheard of. Two primary theories are held among scholars regarding Paul's citizenship. The first links the privilege to his birth in Taurus, a free city in the extreme southeast of what is now Turkey, arguing that the free status of Taurus conferred a conferred citizenship on all who were born there. Others dispute that claim, noting that Taurus was a free city, but not a Roman colony. Instead, it is thought that Paul's father or even grandfather was granted citizenship for some service to the empire. It then would have been passed on to Paul. A related question troubles some Bible students. Was Paul right to avoid persecution by claiming his citizenship in a pagan empire? Was it an unfair advantage denied to most believers? It is certainly true that most Christians at this time, whether Jews or Gentiles, enjoyed no such recourse when facing the power of the Roman state. It might 
And it is true as well that Jesus forthrightly told his followers to expect persecution and not try at all costs to evade it. He certainly did not make use of his own status as the Son of God to avoid brutal treatment and the cross. Why did Paul not follow his example here? The first thing we know, we must note is that practically no one in history has has displayed as much willingness to endure persecution as the Apostle Paul. A quick reading of 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29 will put to rest any notion that he shield away from danger and mistreatment. And Roman citizenship provided no sure protection from mob violence that arose spontaneously. On the other hand, Paul's citizenship with the official protection it conferred afforded him a foot in the door to take the gospel to places that otherwise were inaccessible. The appeal to Caesar reported in Acts 25, 11 through 12 brought Paul and his messengers into the heart of Roman officialdom. And that would not have been possible without Roman citizenship. So we should see it as a tool that both God and Paul used to advance the cause of Christ, not as a means to evade hardship. A sudden respect, Acts 22, 29. Paul's affirmation of citizenship nevertheless brought an immediate change in his relationship to his captors. The soldiers who had been about to administer the examination by scrounging probably backed away when they heard that Paul was a citizen. The commander was suddenly afraid as well, realizing he had put a Roman citizen in chains. The next day he started the, the legal machinery that he hoped would bring back a quick resolution to Paul's case, verse 30. That resolution would not be quick at all, but under God's superintendence, the, the process that Paul would endure for the next two years would mightily advance God's work. Questions 1. Why did Jesus appear to Paul upon his return to Jerusalem as a new convert? 2. What objection did Paul raise to the Lord's command? 3. How did Paul make the same argument to the crowd before him? Four, what set off the crowd into another violent rage? Five, why did Paul ask the centurion about the legality of scrounging a Roman citizen? Six, how did the Roman commander react to this development? Seven, what made Roman citizenship a, com a coveted status in the empire? Eight, what might the commander have been implying with his comment about his new citizenship? 9. How did Paul respond? 10. What was the immediate result of Paul's citizenship affirmation? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, August 29, 2021. Thank you for listening. God bless.